Well, we're going to be in the book of Ruth, so if you would stand for the honor of reading God's word, we're going to be in Ruth. I want to read chapter 1, first several verses here. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. She was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose and her daughters-in-law in return to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return, each of you, to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept, and said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night, and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Naomi said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Let's pray. Lord, this morning as we look at the story of Ruth, I pray that you would give us a hearing heart today to hear and see the beauty of the story of redemption. Lord, this morning, I don't know what people are going through. I don't know uh, what struggles they may be battling. But Lord, I know that you are our redeemer. And today we can come to you. So God, may we look to you. Help me to preach plain and clear today, Lord. I do realize that there is a strict judgment on my life in rightly dividing your word of truth. I do accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name and I pray in his name and I preach. Amen. When we read the story of Ruth, it is a story of, of hope. It's a story of redemption. It's a beautiful love story right in the middle of a chaotic life. It tells us that this happened during the days of Judges. Now, as we've been reading through the Old Testament, we've read through the book of Judges. At the very end of the book of Judges, it gives us really... Uh, the story of how people live their lives at the very end. In the book of Judges, it describes the society and the culture as one being in which everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That was the, the way of thought. That was the philosophy. That was the way of living. Just do what you feel is right. Everyone just did what they thought was right in their own eyes. And, and, and we can look at that and we can say, boy, that, that sounds like our world. That sounds like all, our culture. You know, nobody having a fear of God, nobody really seeking God. And we can, we can look at all around us and think, man, we're in a dry place. But within that story of the reality of people 
not seeking God, living life their way. There is a truth in the story of Ruth that there is a God who still seeks and saves the lost. Amen? That no matter what's going on in society, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how corrupt it gets, no matter how wicked we think it is, there's still the story of redemption. And that means there's always hope in Christ. Amen? And that's where we are. Ruth takes place, the story uh, takes place in the middle of the judges when, when everybody's just living life how they see fit. Now, when we read the story of Ruth, it's very important and helpful if we know the meaning of the people's names. So, here we have the characters, Elimelech and Naomi, their husband and wife, okay? Elimelech means, my God is king. Naomi means pleasant or pleasantness, or it can be the pleasantness of Jehovah. So here we have a godly couple. They are living in, their, they're from, he's from Bethlehem of Judah. Mark that down uh, on your margin in your Bible as we look forward to that. And, uh, and they experience a famine in Bethlehem. Now Bethlehem means house of bread. It's a little you know, ironic here that there is a famine in the house of bread. But it shouldn't seem too uh, ironic because haven't we all faced famine even in the house of God? Haven't you experienced loss even when you've been faithful to God? Even when God, you, you have served God, followed God, loved God, but there's been times of dry seasons in your life. Anybody ever go through a dry season of life where it just seems like, uh, man, it just seems like there's no fruit. There's no fruitfulness. It seems like I'm, I'm weary. And uh, old scholars and theologians used to call it uh, the, the dark, the midnight of the soul. Just that, that, that seems like you pray and you don't hear anything. Well, here they are in this famine. So what do you do? Do you just bury, bury in, dig in, and you say, okay, I'm going to remain in the house of God and the, and where, there, where there's the bread, the, the, the house of bread, and I'm going to believe that God's going to just see me through this? Or do you look for other options? Well, they looked for other options. So they leave Bethlehem, the house of bread, and they go to Moab. Now, Moab means wasteland, okay? So they leave the house of bread to go to wasteland. Have any of y'all ever made that move? Huh? You, you, you've left where, where you should be thinking you're going to go somewhere better because the grass is always greener and then you get to the other side and you realize it's what? It's just grass, and, and you, 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 know, you, you go out and you venture on your own, and then you end up in a wasteland. And so here, this is the situation. Now, in Moab, Naomi experiences some great heartache and loss. What happens? Well, she has two sons, right? Their names are Malon and Kilion. Now, Malon means great infirmity. Kilion means uh, wasting away. You know, we could, we could maybe see that maybe they were sickly at birth and they, they just always had something with them that was not healthy because we read they, they pass away. She loses her husband to death and her two sons. So here Naomi, she's a widow, and now her two sons have passed away. Orpah and Ruth have both lost now their husbands. And so we have a situation where they're in Moab wasteland and everything seems to be crumbling underneath them and it is falling apart. Now, this affects Naomi. This speaks to Naomi and Naomi begins to believe lies about herself. Now, here, here's what we got to understand. We cannot let our circumstances and we cannot let our feelings to define 
who we are. Okay, you with me? Circumstances change. Feelings change. How many of y'all have had some good moments in life? And then some bad moments in life? And then some good moments again in life? And then bad moments and then good moments? And, and our life often looks like the stock exchange, right? It's just up and down and, and up and down. Highlights and, and so we cannot allow our circumstances or what's happened to us or how we feel about that to give us our identity. Naomi, she's, she's lost. She's lost all hope. What does she say? She, she tells Ruth and Orpah, go back to your, go, go back to your, your family. She hears that there's food now in, Beth, in Bethlehem. And so she's going to go back. But instead of encouraging them to come with her, man, the circumstances of life has made her bitter, has made her depressed, probably even a little bit angry, and even doubting her own faith. I wonder how many this morning, I wonder how many watching, that because of what happens to you, you begin to believe this lie. God doesn't love you anymore. He's abandoned you. There's not even a God. You're wasting your time. All of these thoughts go through our mind. Maybe when sickness comes or when death comes or when uh, a loss of a job comes or a problem in marriage comes up and, or issues with your kids and we have all of these disappointments and circumstances and wasteland moments where it's difficult and it's hard. And the question becomes, what do we believe? Do we believe the lies about those circumstances and how we feel at that moment to determine who we are? Because she said, you all just need to go back. Just go back to your home place. Go back to even your own gods. That's how low she had come. And they both respond. They say, no, we want to go with you. We want to go with you. She says, no. She says, go back. Go back. I don't have... You know, there's, there's no hope with me. She's lost all hope. Any of you ever been at that place of your life where you've just lost all hope? Orpah, her name means double-minded. She was, yeah, I want to stay with you, but then the final challenge, she says, okay, I'm going to go back. So she goes back to her family, but Ruth, Ruth means beauty. Ruth means foresight. The ability to see. What does it say about Ruth? It says Ruth clung to her. Now Ruth clung to her. And I, I want to read this again because I think this is one of the most amazing statements of faith in the Bible that we have in Ruth chapter 1 verse 16. But Ruth says to her, do not urge me to leave you. Or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people then. Your God, my God. Where you die, that's where I'll die. Man, what a woman of faith. This lady, her whole life has been changed because she encountered the one true God and she had forsook all of her false gods and idols, she had embraced the God of Elimelech and Naomi and said, I believe in the God of Israel. She's not a Hebrew. She's a Moabite, an enemy of God's people. But yet she had a life change moment and she said, Naomi, no, I'm going with you. I'm not going to leave you. Man, isn't that the heart cry of what a Christian should be like? Huh? When God calls us out of our sin and out of our shame, we say, Lord, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I'm going to follow who? You. And so she shows and demonstrates this faith, this trust, this belief in God. She says, no, Naomi, I'm not leaving you. I'm going with you. So they head back to Bethlehem. 
Chapter 1, verse 19 says, So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? Now, the, ten years had passed. Now, now, ten years, you change it a lot in ten years, right? How many of you all get those, those Facebook memories pop up? How many of y'all have ever looked through a picture of you 10 years ago? You're like, man, I looked a little different back there in 10 years. Now think about 10 years of living in wasteland, of having a heartache, loss, pain. Your husband dies. Your two sons die. It, 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 it's hard. Naomi's had a, she, she's had it hard for 10 years, and she comes back. She probably doesn't look the same. Her smile that she once had, the pleasant smile of the joy of the Lord had vanished. Now she had a heavy heart and a sadness to her. And she comes walking in and, is that, is that Naomi? And, and look at how Naomi identifies herself. Verse 20, she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me joyful. No, call me bitter. For that's what Mara means. Call me bitter. I'm hardened. I'm depressed. I'm, I'm angry. I had, but now I'm empty. You see, the enemy loves to claim his identity on you. I don't know what you all have went through. I don't know what travel you've been in. I don't know what area of wastelands maybe you have. Maybe you, you grew up with a, with a parent that said, you're a loser, you'll never amount to anything. You always mess up. Maybe someone you love has walked out on you and said, I'm done, I'm finished, I can't take this anymore. Maybe someone has said to you, you are stupid, you are ignorant. You're ugly, you're unworthy. Whatever identity the Satan tries to put on us, you cannot wear that. Naomi was allowing the circumstances and the feelings that she had about, her, about what was going on in her life to identify who she was. She said, no, I'm not the pleasant one in the Lord anymore. No, I'm bitter. You cannot let your circumstances or your feelings about those circumstances identify who you are. Because that was a lie. God hadn't turned his hand against her. It wasn't that God was angry with her. It wasn't that God had abandoned her. No. What did she have? She had her own life, didn't she? She had her health. She had Ruth who stood by her side and loved her. She had a family to go back to, didn't she? She had a place of where people would love her and embrace her. We're going to see that she has a relative by the name Boaz, who's going to be the kinsman redeemer, who means the strength of the Lord. And most importantly, she did have the Lord on her side. Can I tell you? Anytime you feel like God has abandoned you, that's a lie from the enemy. Amen. You know, Satan would love for you to just wallow in your pity, wallow in failures, wallow in whatever you may say, it may think your circumstance that is, uh, you know, I tell you what, if I didn't have any bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. God doesn't love you anymore. He's abandoned you. That's a lie. How do we know that's a lie? Because God has promised in his word that he will never leave us or forsake us. Right? You're not loved. Nobody loves you. That's a lie. 
How do we know that's a lie? Because Jesus says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Don't let your circumstances identify you. Naomi, she's at a bad place, but thank God for Ruth. You see, Ruth, Ruth had the same heartache and pain. But see, she had foresight. She, she could see. She had, she had a faith. She lost her husband. She was a widow. She lost her father-in-law. She lost her brother-in-law. She went through some of the similar experiences that Naomi did, but yet when we read in chapter 2, Ruth gets straight to work. She's not going to wallow. She's not going to say, God's abandoned me. She's not going to let the circumstances identify her. No, she's going to go by faith and keep following the Lord. Same situation, different outlook. It reminds me of the story of the old mule my, my pastor told. Uh, pastor Mike, he, he said, uh, this, this farmer's mule, he was, he was so fed up with this mule, this mule just was so stubborn, wouldn't do anything. And it's getting old, and, and so he's just going to, he just going to, you know, he was through with it. So he was burying this, he was digging this big, huge ditch, okay? And that old sorry mule stepped into it and fell into it. And the farmer said, I tell you what, this is a worthless mule. I might as well go ahead and be done with it. So he took the dirt and he started throwing it on the mule. He said, I'll just bury this mule. Now that mule's got a predicament, right? That mule could be in that, that hole and say, poor me, I'm in this hole. I'm not going to be able to do anything about it. I, just, I guess I'm just going to be buried alive, right? This mule, no, this mule wasn't ready to give in. That old farmer picked up that dirt, threw it in the hole, hit the back of the mule. That mule shook it off. Stomped it down. He just kept throwing the dirt in there, throwing the dirt in there. That dirt would keep hitting that mule on the back. That dirt would fall on his back, and he'd shake it off and just pat it down. Shake it off, pat it down. I need some music to do that, right? Shake it off. <laughs> just shake it off and pat it down. And before long, that, that farmer's there just throwing that dirt, throwing that dirt. And all of a sudden, before he knew it, he looked up and that mule was looking him eye to eye. Because you see, what happens when life throws dirt on you, when Satan throws dirt on you, lies on you, when circumstances are hard and difficult, what do you do? Do you just let it bury you and say, there's nothing I can do about it. I might as well just give up. God doesn't love me anymore. He's abandoned me. He doesn't love me. I'm just gonna let I'm just gonna let it all crumble on me and I'm just gonna give up. Or do you say, Nope, I'm not letting this. I don't believe that lie. I'm a child of God. I am a person of destiny. I have a hope and a future. I have a God who says that He loves me and He cares for me and He has plans that I I can't even imagine for me. Do you have that kind of outlook? So Ruth, she goes in. She's following the Lord. She's, she's going to work. And she immediately starts gleaning a field. She fits this category. If you've been reading through the scripture, it all makes sense, doesn't it? The gleaning laws. That any foreigner or poor person or a widow had the right to pick up the scraps that was left over during the harvest. Ruth fits all three of those categories. She's poor, she's a widow, and she's a Moabite. So she goes to gleaning. She asks the gentleman, can I glean in this field? He says, yes. There's women along working as well, and, and she starts gleaning, and she is a worker. Oh, she's a worker. She works from daylight to dark. I mean, she's, just, she's not quitting. She's just a working. She's cleaning the field. And then here comes Boaz. Boaz, strength of the Lord, comes in. He says, who is that? Oh, that's, that's Ruth. That's Naomi's daughter-in-law. They're back, and she asked if she could glean in the fields. And we told her, yeah, and I tell you what, she has been working nonstop. She's not stopped hardly at all. 
You see, Ruth had a different type of character, didn't she? So what do you do in the wastelands of life? You know, your character, your character, who you are when nobody's looking, who you are in the down moments, who you are. She had a character that she loved, and she was a faithful woman, and it just carried all through her life, right? Your character matters. Having faith in God, it matters. Because there's, there's promise that follows. He knows about her. He's heard about her. Look at what it says there. Chapter 2, verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go glean in another field or leave this one. But keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And Boaz says... I will protect you. You don't have to go to any other field. You have all you need. Because I know you're a woman of character. You're a woman of faith. I've heard about how you stuck with Naomi, how you abandoned your false gods. He goes over to the guy and says, hey, let her even glean from the sheaves and pick up some bundles and throw them down and let her have them. He's, like, He's taking care of her. It's good to have a godly lady, Amen. The character that matters. I, I've told this story uh, several times throughout the history of the church, but I, I'll tell it again. You know, when, when I was in college, I had already had the call of ministry on my life, so I knew I was going to go on to seminary and pursue full-time pastoral ministry. Uh, but I wasn't in, I didn't have, hadn't, wasn't dating anyone, and, and uh, I would have, I wanted to be married, right? Amen. But I was going to be a preacher, so, like, you think it's hard finding a, uh, you know, someone to date just normally. Try telling you're going to be a preacher. Shoo! So, so the pool shrinks dramatically. And then you're wanting, you know, I'm, I'm praying about the qualities that I, I want to have in a wife. Shoo, shoo. Lord, I, I, I do want to be attracted to her, right? And just... And everything just keeps getting, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Lord, I, I don't know. Is this going to happen? And then he brought Michelle into my life. And we got introduced. And uh, we started talking, courting, dating. Went over to her dorm room, and, and she, I noticed she had Bibles there in her room. I thought, huh, that's nice. That's nice. But now, a lot of people have Bibles. Let's just see. Looking at her Bible, like this girl, she just didn't have a Bible. She actually read her Bible. How do I know? Because all through the Bible, there's markings, there's writings, there's things underlined, there's notes on this. She's got a Bible study that she's taking notes in there. And I'm thinking, this girl is not just a Christian who actually has a Bible, actually reads her Bible, and actually loves the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And then she fell down at my feet and said, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I added that last part in. <laughs> but Ruth, man, she's, she's a special lady. She's got faith. Went through the circumstances that Naomi did, but didn't allow that to identify who she was. And so she goes, she gleans, she gleans throughout the whole harvest year. And then Naomi, in chapter 3, 
helps her develop a plan. This is pretty interesting. In Ruth chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? you know, don't you think it's time that we see if this, this guy who is our kinsman redeemer might be able to do something uh, on our behalf? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And, and, and she replied, All that you say I will do. Now I want to notice something very interesting about Ruth here, about Naomi's instructions to Ruth, and how this really applies to the Christian life, and how Ruth models of what it means to be a faithful follower of the Lord. What's the first thing she says to do? She says, wash, wash yourself. The question we ask this ourselves as Christians all the time is, how can I best follow the Lord? How can I make the most of each day? Well, number one, wash in the water of his word. You say, I, I, I want to be used by God. Wash in the water of his word. Spend time in his word. And then she says, anoint yourself. We have been anointed as believers by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have been anointed. We have the anointing on us the Holy Spirit and so that when we get up in the morning if we wash in the water of his word then we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit amen he says put on some new clothes she told her put on some new clothes what does Paul say in his writings to the Ephesians and also in Colossians put off the old self and what put on the new self put on those new clothes don't wear those rags of of, uh, of, of sin and shame. Put on the clothes of righteousness. Put on the robe that Jesus has given you. And then she told, him, she told her to, to lay at his feet, to approach him properly. We approach God properly. There's a right way to approach God. Right, We approach, we approach God the Father through Jesus the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then it says she obeyed, she obeyed everything that she said. What are we supposed to do? Obey everything that he says. Walk in obedience. So here this lady, she follows the orders of Naomi, and she goes. And then verse 8, at midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman laid his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings of your servant, for you are a redeemer. She's, uh, she's pr proposing, she's, she's saying, I, I want you to redeem us. I, I know who you are. I know you're the strength of the Lord. I, I know that, that you are our kinsman redeemer, that you can purchase the property that we can't afford to purchase, the, the property that uh, Elimelech had to mortgage before they went to Moab, you see, the kinsman redeemer law was to protect people who were poor from getting taken advantage of so that the rich couldn't just buy up all the property. And so if you had a relative who was able to purchase that property and redeem, and, and if you were a widow and that person was, was not married, they could take that lady as a wife and, and redeem them and, and provide for them. She knows that. And his response is this. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. He's delighted by this request that she asks. He says, you, you are a, you're a young lady. She's beautiful. 
You could have went off and got married to a younger guy if you wanted to, whether they, you know, search after riches or whoever. But dad, you've come and you want me to redeem you. Now, there's one issue in the story. There is another relative that's closer that his first option to redeem. And he says, I have to go check with him to see if he is interested. And the story goes, he is not. And so Boaz, strength from the Lord, the kinsman redeemer, he goes to the court, uh, the record of their day, their day, and makes the legal purchase of the property and the right to marry Ruth. Redemption. The word redemption means to purchase, to buy back. He bought back the property that was in the family and he brought them under his wings. And then chapter 4, verse 13, it says, So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed which means servant or worshiper of God. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David, the lineage of Jesus. It also tells us the lineage that Boaz Boaz came from Perez. From Tamar. From the tribe of Judah. Redemption. Oh, the story of Ruth. Man, it is a beautiful love story about how this man named Boaz redeems Ruth and Naomi. But it's more than just a love story about Boaz. It is a love story of God's love for mankind. You see, in order to be a kinsman redeemer, you had to be related to them. You had to be related. Jesus, he's our kinsman redeemer. Well, how is he related to us? Well, the Bible says that he did not count equality with God to be a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself and took on flesh. God became man to relate to us so that he might redeem us. To be a kinsman redeemer, you had to be able to pay the purchase price. You see, Naomi had no money. Ruth had no money. They were poor. They had not the ability to buy the land back. They couldn't purchase it for themselves. So they needed a kinsman redeemer who was wealthy enough to purchase that property. 
can I remind us, we're all poor and wretched and sinful. There is none righteous, no, not one. And there's not one person here that can buy back your salvation. You cannot purchase redemption by your own merit, by your own works, by your own philosophy. It... It takes someone who can purchase your redemption and the only way that that could be purchased was through the blood of Jesus Christ, someone who was perfect and pure. And he bought us with the blood on Calvary. But not only did you have to be related, not only did you have to be able to purchase, you had to be willing to make the purchase. You see, the one kinsman redeemer, potential kinsman redeemer, he wasn't willing, but Boaz was. God did not have to redeem us. You aware of that? He didn't have to redeem us. We all went to Moab. We all went to the wasteland. We all said, we're going to live it our way. We're going to follow our standards. We're going to, we don't need you, God. We're fine. We're going to do it our way. We all traveled to Moab. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God could have left us right there. He could have been fine. He would have been just just to live, leave us in our sin, just to, to leave us where, where we chose to be. But God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners or while we were yet enemies of God he sent his son to die for us Jesus was willing to pay the price for redemption so that you might be forgiven that you might be set free so that you could be brought into his homeland and that his place would be your place And that where he would be, you would be. And he calls us into a life to follow him. A Christian service to say, Lord, our Redeemer, Jesus, you redeemed me, you bought me, I'm yours. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Whatever you want me to say, I'll say, I will cling to you. This morning, if you need a relationship with Jesus, guess what? All you got to do is call up on the name of the Lord. If you need to be forgiven of your sin, call and ask the Lord, redeem me, purchase me. I need you. And he will save you by his great grace. Amen? For those of us who do know him, may we be encouraged today. And may it make us look at our Redeemer and say, thank you that you have purchased me out of sin and brought me into righteousness. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you. We thank you for this story of Ruth. We thank you for the picture of your grace. We we thank you for the picture of your love that you have for us when we're your enemy. As Boaz covered Ruth, so Lord, you cover us. Lord, today, if there's someone that needs to know you as Lord and Savior, would you speak to their heart? May they be renewed and restored. May your identity be given to them as child of God. And those of us who know you, may we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. Let's respond. Hey, let's come and pray. If you need to pray, let's pray.